Speak to quarters. Run out the gun. Stand by this covered battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Lynch stop ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire. <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's indomitable man of the sea, Horatio Hornblower. start of that one was the most miserable and distressing. My ship was seriously undermanned. I was suffering from the seasickness which always attacked me at the beginning of the voyage. My mind was torn between anxiety for my wife, Mariah, who would be having our baby before my return, and misery at the marriage of Lady Barbara Wellesley. And now I was saddled with a cat of six fat, stupid, lovely merchant ships. As I stood on my quarter deck in the grey dawn with the wind whipping through the rigging, I cursed those Indiamen for their slowness in acknowledging my signals. They must man those Indiamen with blockage, sir. Uh, the Lord Mornington's been flying that signal at the dip for ten minutes. Well, they haven't the sense to clear the halyards. Oh, well. I've, I've given them their course for Finisterre, and they must follow it as best they can. Uh, I shall go below, Mr. Bush. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, one moment, sir. What's that? Something's happening. The warmer castles hold a wind. Look, sir. You can see her through the glass. Mm, yes. Yes, she's spun round. She's she's clawing up to windward towards us. Surely she's signaling. Where's the signal, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. It's a jumble signal. I can't read it. What? Looks like number 29, sir. Huh? But it can't be. That means discontinue the action. And now she's hold it down. Well, there goes another. It's, it's number 11. Yeah. Number 11, sir. That means enemy in sight. I say that. What can you see on the port bow? Nothing only the wall the castle, sir. Are you oh. sure? Yeah, I can see them now, sir. Two luggers on the port bow. Luggers, eh? That can only mean privateers, sir. If they can pick off an East Indiaman, it'll be a feather in their caps. Then we shall prevent them from feathering their caps. Hands to quarters, Mr. Bush. Aye, aye, sir. Hands to quarters. <laughs> We'll need our wits about it, Mr. Bush. It's going to be difficult. They will maneuver to cut off a ship to windward of us. Lay alongside a border while we're beating up against the wind. That's it. Those luggers are as quick as lightning in stage. The Indiamen are so slow and our crew is so raw. There are two luggers. We shall have to parry two thrusts at once. You can see them plainly now, sir. Two masters. They have about uh, 20 guns apiece, nine pounders. We could blow them out of the water if they were fools enough to come in close range. I'd say they carry about 150 men each, and all mad for gold. Yes, have the guns loaded and run out, Mr. Bush. Aye, aye, sir. Run out the guns! That's the leading lugger, sir. Didn't see where her shot went. Hell must stop it. Ah, really, sir. Meet her steady. Yes, Look at the wall of the castle shearing off. She'll run into the next ship in a minute. Can we reach her in time? Yes, we're too close now for the luggers to death. Ah, that's 
course, so they're swinging away to avoid our broadside. Back to lane, Topsail. We must keep the windward of the convoy so that we can dash down to any danger point. Let the convoy get ahead again. Hello, sir. What are they up to now, sir? They're leading the convoy. Yes, they're going to swing round presently and attack the starboard ship. Clap on sail. We must intercept. Yes, there they go. They're after the Lord Mornington. Hard aboard. Hard aboard, sir. They're going to switch to the warmer castle, or I'm a Dutchman. Yes, I thought so. Ha, <laughs> ha. Ah, you thought ahead of them there, sir. We cut them off again. If only the Indiamen have the sense not to scatter. Once they break up, we'll never get to the threatened one in time. Hello. What's the game now? Well, they've thought up some plan, I imagine. They're working a stern of us. Yeah. Yes, I think I see their intention. They're going to diverge. Yes. Here they come, sir. One to starboard, one to port. Yes. They're going to attack both wings of the convoy at once. Uh -huh. We'll never get across from one to the other in time. We must. There's no alternative. The starboard lugger is slightly nearer. We'll tackle her first. Starboard, two points. Starboard, two points. We'll cross the lugger's bars on this course. She'll have to edge away to avoid our broadside, and that'll keep her off the convoy. Well, what about the other one, sir? This course is taking us away from the convoy. Can't help that. Our only hope is to get back in time. We've edged this one away at least. The second lugger, sir. She's attacking the warmer castle to pause. Hands to the braces. Hard as starboard. All right, say it now, Mr. Bush, quickly. sight of the Sutherland rushing down upon her, she sheared off again. Obviously, she worked round to make a dash at one of the outside ships, but I swung the Sutherland round and headed her off. And as it went on, for an hour or more, like a game of hide-and-seek. But with only one lugger to deal with, my task was easier. At last, the Frenchman realized that he was wasting his time. His big lugsel came round, and he thrashed away to windward in search of his crippled colleague. He's off, sir. We'll have no more trouble with those two. No, Mr. Bush, but the captain of that second lugger is, is a fool. If he left his consort to look after itself and hung on to us until nightfall, he'd be almost sure to pick off one of our ships in the darkness. Well, yes, you can secure the guns now. Huh? Aye, aye, sir. Secure the guns, Mr. Jello. What are those idiots cheering about? From the noise they're making, you'd think they're one for Mr. 
Bush, stop that noise at once. Send the hands off. I'll speak to them. sees Frenchman. prevented all intercourse and visiting between ships. But now the wind had dropped to a gentle breeze. The Sutherland was slipping slowly along with a westerly breeze abeam, and the six East Indiamen were clustered together only a few cables length to do it. Even before Gerard reported, I had marked the approach of a boat from the Lord Mornington, and had nerved myself for the inevitable polite call. As the visitors came aboard, I saw that the man in the formal frock coat was Captain Osborne of the Lord Mornington. His companion was resplendent in full civilian dress with ribbon and star. Good afternoon, Captain Hornblower. Captain Hornblower. I would like to present to you Lord Eastlake, Governor-designate of Bombay. This is a great pleasure, Your Lordship. Uh, the, 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 the pleasure is mine, Captain. I have come to beg of you to accept, on behalf of your ship's company, this purse of 400 guineas. 400 guineas? Sir, uh, it has been subscribed by the passengers of the East India Convoy in recognition of the skill and the courage displayed by the Sutherland in action with two French privateers. Well, this is most generous and <coughs> totally undeserved, sir. I, nevertheless, I greatly appreciate your kindness, and on behalf of my ship's company, I thank your lordship. And I, sir, am the bearer of a most cordial invitation to you and your first lieutenant, to join us at dinner in the Lord Morning. Oh, thank you for your courtesy, sir. I deeply regret that I must decline the invitation, but we part company in two hours. Well, that is a pity, uh, Captain Hornber. Uh, cannot you be persuaded? Oh, my lord, I'm on the King's service and under the most explicit orders from the Admiral. Well, will you then, please, Captain, I, uh, I understand. Uh, but at least you will allow me to, to, to meet some of your officers. <laughs> Uh, begging your pardon, sir, but uh, there's no need to turn all that money over to us and the men. You could treat it as prize money and take your share under prize rules. Thank you, Mr. Bush, but I can't accept that sort of reward from civilians. However, the crew must show appreciation. Man the yards and have the men give three cheers as Lord Eastlake's boat pulls away. Aye, aye, sir. Man the yards! Now then, men, Lord Eastlake has brought you a present for saving the convoy. Three cheers for his lordship! I'm desperately short of men. I'm going to take some from those East Indiamen. But, sir, they're John Company ships. Their men are exempt from pressing, sir. Nobody's exempt when the King's service needs him. I'm aware that I'm contravening Admiralty orders, but I plead necessity. Now, will you excuse me, sir, if I point out that John Company is the most powerful corporation in England? It might be a bad policy to offend them, sir. I'll be a judge of my policy, Mr. Gerard, and I'll take the responsibility. You will obey orders. I hope those ships will sight no land until they reach St. Helena. It'll be three or four months before any protest can reach England, and a uh, further six months before any censure can reach me in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, it's possible that in six months we shall all be dead. Oh, oh. Thank you, sir. Give the boat's crews pistols and cutlasses just to show that I'll stand no nonsense. I want 20 men from each of those ships. <gasps> 20 from each, sir? <laughs> That's flouting the law on the grand scale, sir. That's the only sensible scale on which to flout the law, Mr. Bush. Captain Hornblower, this is an outrage, sir, and I must protest. 
Lieutenant Anstead. At this very moment, your lieutenant is parading my crew with a view to impressment. He's acting by my orders, sir. But I... Why, I can hardly believe it, sir. Well, are you aware that this is a flagrant violation of Admiralty regulations? A perfect outrage, sir. The ships of the Honorable East India Company are exempt from investment. And I, as Commodore, must protest to the last breath of my body against any contravention of the law. I shall be glad to receive your protest when you make it, sir. Oh, well, when I make it? But, but, but I have delivered it, sir. I have made my protest. But uh, will you not allow me to ask for volunteers from among your crew, Captain? Uh, there may be a few men who'd like to join the King's service. <laughs> oh, I cannot imagine, sir, that... Many men will be foolish enough to exchange the comfort of the East India Company's service for the rigors of a ship of the line, but, uh, well, <laughs> yes, I would agree even to that. Well, uh, your seamanship in the affair with the privateers was so admirable that, um, frankly, I find it hard to refuse you anything. That's very good of you, sir. Allow me to escort you to your gig. I will recall my boats. Since they will have taken the volunteers first, we can rely on it that they have all the willing ones on board, and I shall return the unwilling ones. Thank you, Captain Osborne. Thank you. <laughs> he calmed down wonderfully, sir. Pity we had to give way. But we might get a few volunteers out of that lot, sir. Mm -hmm. I feel sure we shall, Mr. Wolf. Here's the launch of the cutter coming back, sir. They're both loaded with men to the gunnel, sir. They're passing Captain Osborne's gig now. Mm -hmm. He's waving and shouting something to them. Mr. Gerard and Mr. Rayner are very properly paying no attention to him. Stand by. The man will be coming aboard very shortly. Silence down there! The captain will address you. Now, listen to me, men. You're probably a bit bewildered at your sudden change of circumstances, but let me assure you that the entry port through which you've just passed... Is a gateway to glory. Yeah, we know what sort of glory. Yeah, we do. Have the man's blood who raises his voice or interrupts again. For 17 years, your country's been struggling with the Corsican tyrant. Your ease and comfort has been possible only because of the loyalty and courage of the brave men who've manned British men of war. Now you have the opportunity of joining that gallant company. But you've got other opportunities, too. The chance of prize money. The convoy from which you've come presented my crew with 400 guineas for their work in saving you from the French privateers. And there's more, much more, to be made by willing men on the East Coast by the taking of French prizes. You'll serve your country and yourselves at the same time. No man is treated harshly on my ship unless he deserves harshness. You're here, and it's in your hands now whether your lives go well or ill. And what I do, I do in the name of His Majesty the King. That's all. Guard, march these men down to the main deck. Mr. Bush, have the goodness to go down and read the articles of war to them. Aye, aye, sir. I have taken a bold step, but the necessities of war demanded boldness. I now had nearly a full complement of crew with these 120 most of them able seamen. By the time Bush returned from reading the men into the service, the boats were inboard and we were all ready to square away. Mr. Vincent, signal to the convoy. All men have volunteered. Thank you. Goodbye. All men have volunteered. Uh, thank you. Goodbye. Uh, aye, aye, sir. I beg your pardon, sir, but uh, what will you say to the Admiralty? I shall tell them that I took the men with the permission of the Commodore. I did, too. He said I could keep any men who volunteered. Uh, yes, sir, but uh, not many did, really. You know seamen as well as I do, Bush. It'll be a year before we get back to England, and in that time I shall be surprised if I don't convince most of them that they did volunteer. We only want a bit of luck and a few prizes, and those fellows will swear to anything. <laughs> it's a master stroke, sir. And the Admiral Retail will be reluctant to prosecute. They know as well as we do how necessary seamen are. Signals gone, sir. The Lord Mornington is replying. Ah, uh -huh. what does she say? Captain Osborne to Captain Hornblower. Do not understand your signal. A wait boat. Thank you. Is that all sail? Hands for braces. Square away there. Mr. Vincent, hoist another signal, please. Just one word. Aye, aye, sir. Which word, sir? Goodbye. <laughs> A 
Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. Thank you.